it's not that we intend to have negative attitudes or ambivalent beliefs about what it is to grow old and to live life as an older person, but institutionally, and societally, we're surrounded by a lot of messages that suggest that somehow, just because you're old, you're going to not really understand your care, not be able to take care of yourself, not be able to do things that somehow a stereotypically younger person would actually be able to do. Just because someone carries a diagnosis of cognitive impairment doesn't mean that they can't engage with you in a relationship, that they can't care for themselves, that they don't find meaning and purpose in their lives. Commit to making cancer care age-friendly. You'll be glad you did for your own practice, for your friends, for your family, for your patients, and for their families as well. You're listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast, where ONS Voices Talk Cancer, a resource from the Oncology Nursing Society. Through conversations with subject matter experts, we examine the important issues in oncology nursing from new treatments to patient-centered research to advancements in clinical practice. Join us as we hear from nurses in all facets of oncology care, from bench to bedside and everywhere in between. Welcome to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. I'm your host, Stephanie Jardine, Oncology Clinical Specialist at ONS. And today we are talking with ONS member, Sarah Kagan. And Sarah, you've got a lot of titles. So why don't you introduce yourself for us today? Absolutely, Stephanie. I'd really be pleased to do that because I do hold a number of roles. They all happen to be at the University of Pennsylvania. So first, I'm the Lucy Walker Honorary Term Professor of Gerontological Nursing in the School of Nursing at Penn. I'm also really privileged to be clinically active. My clinical appointment is as gerontology clinical nurse specialist in the Abramson Cancer Center at Pennsylvania Hospital, which is part of Penn Medicine, our health system. Dr. Mary Pat Lynch, um, who's my clinical supervisor and an ONS member, and I always like to remind people that Pennsylvania Hospital is the nation's first hospital. And we also are very excited to be the first part of our cancer center, which stretches across many parts of our health system, to have the age-friendly designation, which is an exciting thing for me as a gerontology clinical specialist. Great. Thank you. And Sarah is going to discuss what nurses should know when caring for patients with complex care needs such as dementia You can also earn free NCPD contact hours after listening to this episode and completing the evaluation we've linked in the episode notes. So thanks for joining me today, Sarah. It's a pleasure. I always love talking about our patients and how we can care for them more effectively and in a more person-centered way. Great. So to start off, let's talk about the programs that you've created for care of individual patients with special and complex needs. Stephanie, you know, it sounds really strange for me to say this now, but it was back in the 1990s that I first introduced the term geroncology nursing at an ONS research conference. It's just, it's hard to even think about that length of time. And since that point in the 1990s, I've really been working consistently, um, both in academic settings and really importantly in clinical settings to build programs for people who are older and living with and after cancer. As I mentioned in the introduction, I am part of the supportive care team at the Abramson Cancer Center at Pennsylvania Hospital within Penn Medicine. And my clinical partner, Dr. Mary Pat Lynch, and I have spearheaded over a number of years development of what is now our age-friendly cancer care program. And I think that while many nurses listening may be familiar with the idea of a geriatric oncology program, which really designates a medical oncology-centered program to provide care for people who are often typically 
over age 75 or 80, they use a chronological age cut point to determine who can benefit from a multidisciplinary approach to improving the medical and more broadly, the entire cancer treatment plan for people typically at the point of diagnosis. We've taken a different approach and become part of a national program that's spearheaded by the Institute for Healthcare Improvement and has a number of national partners called Age-Friendly Health Systems. And that's a a great website, by the way, that uh, people can take a look at to learn more about the idea that when we're talking about age-friendly health systems, we're talking about healthcare that attends to what are called the four M's. Those four M's are what matters, mentation, medication, and mobility. If we improve our focus on and our attention to those four M's, what matters to people, their mentation, and that's not just a cognitive disorder like dementia, but really how people are thinking and remembering that may include anxiety, It may include complications of cancer like hypercalcemia, or it can include two problems that we typically see in cancer care a lot, delirium and depression. And then if we focus on the very common problems of both polypharmacy, which is too many medications, over medication, if you will, it's a broad general definition, but also specifically either taking over-the-counter or being prescribed PIMS, P-I-M, potentially inappropriate medications. And what we know is that older people in the United States are often taking a lot of PIMS. And then finally, mobility. I think every oncology nurse, um, especially if they've worked inpatient, is very worried about fall risk profiles and people actually falling. What we've forgotten in nursing education and practice is that falls aren't actually the problem. They're a symptom of a bigger problem, which is deconditioning, a very common phenomenon in cancer treatment, regardless of people's age. And dysfunction that comes with deconditioning is typically problems with mobility or actual immobility, which makes people less strong, have less balance and less resilience. So they're more likely to fall. So those four M's are really a way of thinking about the person rather than the cancer treatment plan. So geriatric oncology is the medical model and Age-friendly care includes the term that I introduced so many years ago, gero-oncology. It's really about healthy aging and being as healthy, functional, and well, having a sense of well-being as we grow older, because there's no stopwatch that stops and starts at a particular birthday. So our idea that somehow 65 is old is really an outdated notion. And even trying to find another chronological point, like age 75 or 80, probably leads us to the mistaken notion that somehow there's a difference between older people who have cancer and younger people who have cancer that's simply about when they were born, their birth date. Sarah, what a great overview and introduction for us for the podcast today. You've mentioned so many different aspects of that care. So when you have these programs or when when our listeners are, you know, listening to us today and thinking about do we have a program in place or should we create one? What members of the healthcare team are involved in these types of programs? That's really important to think about, Stephanie. And I like to imagine that in cancer care, we're inherently an interprofessional team. But let me highlight some of our partners um, who are maybe key partners when we're talking about addressing the needs of frail individuals or people who are likely to become frail 
during the course of their cancer treatment. Those partners include our oncology social work partners, and if our institution has them, geriatric or gerontology social work partners. So oncology social work and gerontology social work, two separate specialties, both are going to be advantageous for us. In addition, our physical therapy and our occupational uh, therapy colleagues are key partners, especially as we think about both the mentation and the mobility M in age-friendly care. In many ways, our speech-language pathology partners can be valuable resources even if we're not caring for someone who because of either their cancer diagnosis or their comorbid uh, diagnoses, is likely to have a swallowing or a speech problem. And that is because our speech language pathology colleagues are specially educated to do cognitive assessment. So if you're in a community setting and you're thinking, we don't have a memory center, we don't have a dementia specialty team, look a bit more broadly and recognize that both our speech language pathology colleagues and our occupational therapy colleagues are folks who have that extra education and training in cognitive assessment so they can fill a gap. I'd also say that in addition to those colleagues, it's important to recognize that knowing who our patient's primary care provider is or their primary care office will be important in ensuring that we're understanding what the picture of the person's total health is because, of course, our cancer care team can't provide primary care as well as providing the cancer care. I honestly wouldn't have thought about those different areas, the physical therapy and occupational therapy but what great resources that I'm sure almost all nurses who are listening have those departments in their institution that they can tap into if they don't have a specific age-friendly program already set up. So thank you for pointing those out. So just in all we've talked about so far, are there specific complex needs that the older patient with cancer might need to have addressed and how can nurses address that, bring it up, or start that discussion with the patients? Stephanie, complexity is such an important word because in the decades that I've been an oncology nurse, I've become ever more aware of the complexity of cancer care. I've cared for people who are nurses or physicians themselves who are struggling to take in the detail and the magnitude of information that we can provide them, not just about their cancer care and the treatment plan, but about the cancer itself. So I'm always cautious when I use the word complexity to ensure that what we're talking about is the idea that today in our contemporary healthcare system, cancer care itself is very complex. It includes a lot of information that is subcellular, that is genomic, um, that is about a level of information that most people aren't honestly going to deal with on a daily basis. However, I think there are times when complex or special needs often suggest when we use them, kind of, you can tell I'm hesitating here, kind of a bigger problem. And that is that, unfortunately, American healthcare and specifically cancer care tend to be institutionally ageist. It's not that we intend to discriminate against older people. It's not that we intend to have negative attitudes or ambivalent beliefs about what it is to grow old and to live life as an older person. But institutionally and societally, we're surrounded by a lot of messages that suggest that somehow, just because you're old, you're going to not really understand your care, not be able to take care of yourself, not be able to do things that somehow a stereotypically younger person would actually be able to do. And I suppose in a way, I'm here to bust that myth. In fact, consider this, um, and 
if you just think about the people you cared for and your last shift, the last day at work, you'll recognize that if you're in adult oncology, the majority of your patients are in a societal sense considered older. That is, they're over the age of 65. About 60 or more percent, um, depending upon whose statistics you're looking at, about 60 uh, percent of new diagnoses are made in people over the age of 65. Cancer survivors are even older, on average, probably depending upon the cancer site, over the age of 75 or 80. And we have many long-term cancer survivors who are living decades past their diagnosis who are considerably old in chronological terms, but they're often young in spirit. It's important to recognize that what makes people's cancer care more complex often has to do with frailty. So frailty is the phenotypic presentation of declining functional reserve and loss of resilience at a physiologic level, if you will. So frailty is an area of our science that is growing quite rapidly. It's now widely accepted that it's a best practice to screen at least a portion of people entering cancer treatment for frailty. And there are a number of really easy to use frailty screening tools available. What we want to think about is that with frailty and multimorbidity, that is that cancer isn't their only condition, then things get complex, both in terms of cancer treatment, uh, medical oncology, radiation oncology, surgical oncology. Uh, Most people will benefit from a period of prehabilitation where before we start their cancer treatment, we're helping them become optimally nourished. We're helping them uh, build physical strength, flexibility, and balance through physical and possibly occupational therapy. And we're providing them and their care partners or their caregivers, we in our practice like to call them care partners, we're providing them the emotional and spiritual support to get them ready for this journey with us. So that, I suppose, is my brief introduction to the idea that we need to cast aside our ageist understandings, our institutionally and individually ageist understandings of what it is to care for older people living with and after cancer, and to replace that with an idea that in order to create age-friendly cancer care, we need a gateway. And typically, frailty screening regardless of age, is going to pay big dividends because it allows us to think then about what other health and social care resources can we refer people to to get them the best sort of plan of comprehensive support that will carry them through this cancer journey. As you've mentioned, there are just so many aspects to age-friendly care, and you've brought in a lot of the different areas of help that we can get and use for these patient populations. That's exactly what I'm after, Stephanie, is the idea that we want to, in a way, cast aside our assumptions about what it is to live with cancer as an older person and to receive cancer care as an older person and instead think, okay, in a person-centered way, how can I know more about what matters to you, understand more about your mentation, and to avoid, for example, the common ageist understanding that somehow getting old means that we will be cognitively impaired, that it's definitive. It's not. Cognitive change and particularly cognitive impairment, is not a given as we grow older, though cancer treatment may induce some cognitive impairment. And complications, hypercalcemia is my favorite example of this, will frequently introduce what is treatable temporary cognitive impairment. Uh, The condition of delirium, or what is sometimes called acute confusional state, is another classic example 
of a condition we need to be aware of. So we want to think what matters. We want to look at mentation. We want to scrutinize and become much more aware of PIMS, potentially inappropriate medications, so that we can say to our pharmacist colleagues, and this is my opportunity to call out our pharmacist colleagues as another key partner in providing age-friendly cancer care, to scrutinize that medication list, to ask people, can you bring me all of the -the over-the-counter medications that you have taken or sometimes take so that you as an oncology nurse and the pharmacist can say, wow, we think we might have found the source of this side effect, whatever it might be, because here's a drug or here's a drug combination that may be potentiating some problems. And then, of course, mobility. And particularly for our listeners who are inpatient colleagues, falls are so high on our list. But we often are actually promoting risk of falls with our fall risk reduction plans because what we're doing is neglecting mobility and saying, just don't move. The more people just don't move, the more likely they are to fall because they're actually being deconditioned by the hour at a muscular and a skeletal level. So Sarah, You've given us, again, a lot of information, such great information on how we can really look at our different patient populations that we care for. Can you talk a little bit about what are the most appropriate assessments for age-friendly cancer care? You, You know, you've talked a little bit about the frailty assessment too, but just in thinking about the nurses that are listening to our podcast and, you know, thinking about how can I make sure that I'm assessing any patient that I have in the most appropriate way? The first thing I'll say is that if you've been a nurse for a while, and even if you're an oncology nurse who's more recently entered our profession, the first thing I want you to remember is that if you were taught to use the mini mental status exam, the MMSE, please don't do that anymore. That's not supported by evidence for our practice. So what you want to think about as a clinical nurse and as an advanced practice nurse is that if you're not educated in gerontological nursing, if perhaps you just had that brief exposure in your undergraduate program, in your first degree program, what you'll want to learn about is frailty screening. So this isn't an assessment. It is a screening and it's a screening that allows you to gauge the extent to which people are more or less likely to be frail and will benefit from geriatric assessment. Geriatric assessment, typically abbreviated GA or sometimes CGA, comprehensive geriatric assessment, or MGA, modified geriatric assessment, are a set of assessments that are typically done by our colleagues, either a gerontology clinical nurse specialist like me, a gerontology or geriatric nurse practitioner, a geriatrician, or a multidisciplinary geriatric palliative or supportive care team. We as oncology nurses can, if you will, open the door And I talk about opening doors or opening gates, creating a gateway to the rich array of resources that exist outside of our cancer care system. Some common frailty screening tools that you might see noted in the literature that require relatively little effort to be educated um, to be able to use in practice include the Flemish version, um, though it's in English, the Flemish version of the triage risk screening tool, the FTRST, the Vulnerable Elders Survey, the VES-13. These are a couple of examples. The Groningen Frailty Tool is another um, less commonly used tool, but it's one that, again, is between, I think, 13 and 15 items. And it is also showing some pretty robust results in the literature. It's more commonly used in Europe by our European, our ELNS colleagues. These tools take 
just a couple of minutes to a few minutes to administer. And they allow us as nurses to recognize, okay, without making assumptions about the person, this person's screening result shows me that they'll benefit or they won't benefit from further detailed geriatric assessment. And that's the best way to really understand who will benefit and who won't. Two follow-up points on this, and we've had experience in our practice with this. We did a frailty screening um, as a pilot project in our infusion suite, and we screened everyone regardless of age. We're an adult oncology program. We actually had a number of people younger than 40 who screened positive for frailty. We know from the science done with survivors of pediatric cancers that cancer treatment seems to, at an epigenetic level, help people prematurely express the frailty phenotype. So it's important to recognize that, especially in cancer care, we may see very young people who are actually frail and will benefit from geriatric assessment and resources that we would typically associate only with our older patients. And I would say that the other thing to kind of keep in mind is that typically in cancer care, but also throughout healthcare, we've believed that we can sort of do the eyeball test. I can look at you and know that you're old and frail. I can look at you and know that you do or don't need these services. That's really an ageist fallacy, and we need to become evidence-driven in our ability to provide age-friendly care and to recognize that we shouldn't exclude the younger person who's frail any more than we should exclude the older person who isn't frail from the full benefit of our care. That's a really good explanation. And I think for all of the nurses that we do have listening, a lot of new nurses, as well as new to oncology nurses, just understanding how those assessments are going to be helpful for all of their patient populations and really thinking about it to make sure that we are then able to customize their care to what their appropriate needs are. You got it, Stephanie. That's perfect. Great. So I want to kind of move our conversation a little bit and talk about age-friendly cancer care, but let's talk about a patient who may have Alzheimer's or a dementia, and what does that look like for the nurses who are taking care of a patient like that? If you could kind of walk us through what a nurse caring for a patient, whether it's a new diagnosis or possibly, you know, someone who has had the diagnosis for a while, but as you mentioned earlier, talking about the differences in cognition as well as treatment related side effects, but what does that look like? Stephanie, this is an area where a number of colleagues are doing very important research. So the picture has yet to be completed from a nursing perspective. And I have colleagues in the United Kingdom and in Ireland who are going to be delivering some research in the coming years that's going to be really valuable to us. However, there are some fundamentals that I think will help all oncology nurses consider the intersection between dementia and cancer. The first is that it helps to know some basics about dementia. When we talk about dementia, we're talking about a group of diseases that are typically diagnosed through a diagnosis of exclusion. Remember, we can't do brain biopsies. So we're looking at behaviors at typically through a battery of tests that allow us to arrive at a diagnosis. And in the United States, when we're talking about dementia, more often than not, we're talking about Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease represents about 85% of all dementia diagnoses. We also know that there is a condition called mild cognitive impairment, but it's not 
really fully and robustly studied. And it's important for oncology nurses to know that just because someone carries a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment does not mean that they have, and this is a misnomer, early dementia and that they will progress to dementia. So mild cognitive impairment is a separate but related diagnosis. It is also useful to recognize that unlike many cancers, most cancers really, we know that we don't yet have a cure for dementia. And that means that this is a chronic, progressive, irreversible condition. And in gerontological nursing, we typically think about the natural history of a dementia diagnosis as being about a decade or a little bit more. So think 10 to 12 years. That generally means that as oncology nurses, unless we're in a clinic working with oncologists who are helping people and their families to make decisions, we may not see people, um, for example, in the infusion suite or elsewhere in our oncology nursing managed settings who are living with moderate to advanced dementia, because often the larger question comes earlier, and it's about whether or not curative or disease-controlling cancer treatment is appropriate for someone with moderate to advanced dementia. We may see people who have mild cognitive impairment and who are in the early stages of their journey with dementia being treated for cancer. And that's a really a what matters that M sort of question about what matters in terms of the quality, meaning, and purpose they're finding in their lives, what they and their families want, and what's feasible within the frame of their dementia treatment plan and their cancer treatment plan. As we're working with people who carry a known diagnosis of cognitive impairment, here are some tips to help us all create more person-centered, age-friendly care. The first is that just because someone carries a diagnosis of cognitive impairment doesn't mean that they can't engage with you in a relationship, that they can't care for themselves, that they don't find meaning and purpose in their lives. In fact, that's far from the case. And I really would encourage you to take a look at the Alzheimer's Association website, that's www.alz.org, and check out their blog. I think that you might find a number of myths about what it's like to live with dementia being just flagrantly blown apart. And I hope that that's the case because As an example, I have a colleague at the University of British Columbia whose primary research partner, because she does work in dementia, is a person who lives with dementia. We're seeing people with dementia live full and rewarding lives with the right support, with the right behavioral, non-pharmacologic, as well as some pharmacologic treatment, though that's a complex issue that we'll leave aside for today. So it's important to do an assessment to talk to the person's primary care team or their dementia care team, as well as themselves, the person who's living with dementia, and the people they identify as their care partners or caregivers to talk about what they do for themselves, where they need help, and what they give to other people to do for them. That's the place to start, is that person-centered approach, an open, honest conversation where you're saying as an oncology nurse, I'd like you to teach me how you are best supported in your journey with dementia or with mild cognitive impairment. Some people may only need mild memory aids. Other people may need simple behavioral cues. So it's very important to kind of focus your conversation that way. And I think you'll be surprised at the benefits it pays. Thank you. Sarah, I just want to thank you so much for your expertise and your passion, especially for this age-friendly care and to make sure that 
everyone is getting appropriate age-friendly care and just describing that to us and helping us to understand that better. And as we're coming to a close, I just have some questions that I would like to end with. I end all of our podcasts this way, and I'm going to ask them to you in a real quick fire manner. So what are some common misconceptions about caring for older patients with cancer and their capacity to take care of themselves during and after treatment? Older people can't do for themselves. They don't know what's important. They don't know what matters and they can't make decisions. All of those are ageist fallacies and we need to actively dismantle ageism and become age-friendly clinicians and create age-friendly cancer care and age-friendly health care in an age-friendly society. Next, what's something about this patient population that's not often discussed, but you wish people knew more about? That you'll learn more from your older patients and your older patients' family members and friends, particularly if they themselves are older. The wisdom that often comes with decades lived is commonly dismissed. Open yourselves to learning from your older patients And I think you'll be surprised at what you learn and what you can then impart to other people, whether they be patients, caregivers, or in your personal lives, your friends, your family, your community. What additional training or education do oncology nurses need to care for age-friendly care in the populations we've talked about? Thanks, Stephanie. So important. We all need to be educated. And I will say that all of us are concerned about aging well, and we know that lifelong learning helps us age better. We're healthier, stronger individuals if we continue to learn throughout our lives. So two easily available resources. First, the Hartford Institute for Geriatric Nursing, that's HIGN.org, is a great go-to resource. And you can learn about all sorts of things on that site, including the NICHE, the Nurses Improving Care for Health System Elders program that your cancer center, that your hospital, that your clinic might want to get involved in. And I recommend that if you're looking for a compliment to your ONS membership, that whether you're an advanced practice nurse or not... I am a member, but I have no other interest in this uh, recommendation I'm going to make. The Gerontological Advanced Practice Nurses Association, so G-A-P-N-A dot org, is just a tremendous resource. The membership is very cost effective, and you'll be able to keep up to date. And GAPNA offers both a pharmacology conference every year that happens in the spring. It's here in Philadelphia this month, March of 2022. And they offer an annual conference in the fall. Both very worth your time to keep up your gerontological education and help it meet where your oncology nursing education is. And lastly, what are some additional resources, both for patients and providers who want to learn more? One uh, resource that I would absolutely recommend is based at the City of Hope. It's the Cancer and Aging Research Group. And the web address is www.mycarg, M-Y-C-A-R-G.org. They have a special nurses section. They also have a set of tools, which includes a chemotherapy risk calculator that is often really valuable. And I guess in addition to my CARG, I'd recommend SIOG, um, the Society for Geriatric Oncology. The acronym is actually in French, but uh, SIOG is another place where the nursing and allied health section may offer some resources in addition to the other web-based resources that I've mentioned through this podcast. Well, Sarah, it has definitely been a pleasure talking with you today and really learning a lot from you. And I appreciate, as I mentioned, your passion and just the information that you were able to provide to me and all of our listeners. So do you have any final comments for us today? Um, Just that I hope everyone will go ahead and check out the age-friendly health systems. Uh, You can just Google age-friendly health systems and uh, find the uh, webpage and 
become part of it. Commit to making cancer care age-friendly. You'll be glad you did for your own practice, for your friends, for your family, for your patients, and for their families as well. And it's been a joy talking with you, Stephanie. It's always wonderful to meet someone who's as interested in this topic as I am. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Tell us about your favorite part of this episode by leaving a review on iTunes or wherever you downloaded your podcast. For more resources and information about oncology nursing, visit us at ons.org or voice.ons.org. The ideas and opinions shared in this episode represent those of the guests and not necessarily ONS.